Now, when we get over here to chapter 4, and we just barely got a foot in the door, and I'd like to read my translation of the first verse, after these things, metatauta, I saw, and behold, a doa set open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, a voice as of a trumpet speaking with me and saying, Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must come to pass after these things. Metatauta, used twice here. Apparently, John was afraid the Amalanalists would miss it. So he said it twice here in this particular place. Now we are going with the church to heaven. We'll see the throne of God, the 24 elders, and the four living creatures in this chapter. We find that the scene now changes to heaven. And since he's speaking to the church, we assume the church has gone to heaven because it's no longer in the world. We don't see it anymore in the world. It has concluded its earthly career And that is the division that John had said. He was told to write the things which thou hast seen, the vision of the glorified Christ, the things that are, those are church things, and then the things that shall be after these things, metatauta, that is, after the church things. Now, we've come to that because this verse opens with metatauta and it closes with metatauta, the first verse of chapter Four here, and I'm reading it again in my translation. It's an important verse. After these things, metatauta, I saw and behold a doa set open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, a voice as of a trumpet speaking with me and saying, Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must come to pass after these things, metatauta. Couldn't miss it unless you just really wanted to or you had a system of interpretation that this verse would be just a little embarrassing for you. After these things, both opens and closes. And so it's very important. And that repetition certainly lends great emphasis and importance to the phrase. Now, after the church things, the church is concluded, we now have a scene that shifts from earth to heaven. It's a radical change. And the Word of God, though, describes these personages, activities in heaven as normally as it described them on earth. There's no strain or involvement in superstition or mystery. The bridge over the great gulf is passed with ease and a reverent restraint. Only the Holy Spirit could describe things in heaven with as much ease as he describes things on earth. What would have happened if a man had written this book? Why, you know, the minute that he got you to heaven, he'd have the wildest sort of things to say. And you say, how do you know that? Well, read the books that are out today on this type of thing that try to describe the overworld and the underworld and the unseen world. They're rather startling, you see, rather amazing. In fact, that's about the way you can determine what is false today is that type of approach, this awful obsession that even Christians have with demons and with the devil. I have no truck with that outfit at all. Somebody says, why haven't you written a book on it? Well, at first I have to be very frank and say I thought I would. And then when so many of them started coming out, and they're all as wild as a March hare. They all deal with the sensational. But you don't have that here. It's just we move to heaven and the scene is an awe-inspiring scene, but it lacks that which man would put here, of course. Now, the important thing is here the church is not seen under the familiar name it had in the world, but is now the priesthood of believers with the great high priest. The heavenly scenes and creatures greet us in this section Before our attention is drawn to the earth, we're at the beginning of the great tribulation, the four horsemen are to ride. Now, Christ is viewed here in his threefold office in these next two chapters of prophet, priest, and king. And he's worshiped as God because he is God. Now, will you note, after these things, what things again? Church things. 
the church has concluded its earthly career, and we've moved into a new phase altogether. Now, John says, I saw. That's the eye gate. He says, I heard. That's the ear gate. This is still a television program we're looking at, you see. This is the first great television program. And we've had a wonderful treat in our day to a television program taken from the moon. But that's nothing. That's just like going out in our backyard and getting a picture. Now, here is a television program from heaven. I don't know why, but this ought to interest believers a great deal and not cause us to take off like a skyrocket in some wild sort of dreamy stuff. Heaven is a pretty real place, and there's a lot of reality there. And we ought not to get uptight over this scene now that's before us. Let's all just handle it in a normal way, but I can't help but get excited about it all. He says, I saw and I heard, what? A door that was set open. Now, this is one of the four open doors in the book of Revelation. Back in the third chapter, in verse 8, when he's speaking to the church in Philadelphia, you remember he says, I've set before thee an open door. We believe that that's an open door to the Word of God and an open door to getting out the Word of God. And that's the motto of the Through the Bible program, that verse and the one that is before it. He openeth and no man shut it. I tell you, He's a wonderful Savior today, and we hold to this verse. Then you have the open door of invitation. That's in the third chapter here. We saw last time, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock, and if man will open the door, that's the door to your heart. Now we have an open door to heaven here. And then when you get over to the 19th chapter, verse 11 of the book of Revelation, You're going to see a door open in heaven again. It's been open all the time. It wasn't open then. It just had been open. He says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now, that's the door that is open, and Christ comes out from there. And he comes out in the end of the great tribulation, to put down all of the unrighteousness and rebellion against God and establish his kingdom. Now, John did not see this door opening, as the authorized version suggests. This door was open all the time, and it's the door through which believers have come to God for over 1,900 years. Jesus said, "'I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father.'" but by me. And he also said, I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. The open door to heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he also is the one that comes to the door of your heart. That's a wonder and the glory of it all. Now, we enter in by faith. And in modern terminology, we might express it thus. Faith puts us on the launching pad of the church, which is Christ. And at the rapture, we go through the door like a guided missile. Not just shot out in space going nowhere, but if man can hit the target of the moon, I don't think the Lord Jesus will have any problem getting his church into heaven. Now, the invitation here is come up hither. Now, that's heaven's invitation to John. And it is an invitation that's to all of the fellowship that know Christ as Savior. John, you remember, said that in 1 John 1, 3. He says, "...that which we've seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ." Now, he says here, "...we heard it and we saw it, and we declare it unto you." John says, I'm letting you know this so you can have fellowship with him also. And one of these days, you're going up through that open door. Now, we have here the voice as of a trumpet speaking. Now, a trumpet doesn't talk. All these devotees of jazz talk about that Louis Armstrong's trumpet talks. And they talk about, what's the name of this fellow in New Orleans? Al Hurt, I think, is his name. Jazz King, and they say their trumpets talk. 
Well, these addicts on jazz can say that, but they just use an symbol. A trumpet never talks. His voice is like a trumpet. And that's the voice that Paul talked about in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. May I say that that is a definite statement concerning the rapture. When anybody tells you the word rapture is not in the Bible, the word caught up is harpazo, and it can mean caught up, and I like that better than any other, but it can mean rapture. It can mean to snatch up, and I think that Hal Lindsay today calls it the great snatch, the rapture. Now, that's good for these young people today, I guess. That's their vocabulary, but I don't go for that. I just like the word caught up, and it means rapture, and if you don't like the word rapture, then call it harpazo. That's what Paul called it. Won't mean anything to you, but just call it that. But that's what the word means, caught up, and its voice will be like a trumpet. And that pull 